just saying one of the things, just before I begin, one of the things that you realise when you've been uh, a Christian for a while, and you've read the Bible, and you've contemplated God, and you've contemplated Jesus, is that he has such a heart for those who, in the eyes of the world, are on the margins, who are on the edge. And it is incredible to be, um, to realise that and to see, when you see that and you see it for yourself and you realise from the words that you're reading and in how you feel when you contemplate God and you realise his heart for, I'll just label all of those on the margins as the poor, <coughs> it, it's very moving. Yeah. It's really moving. Um, back in September 1996, a young man called John Kirkby, up in Bradford, had been a Christian for maybe about four years. He got himself into a right pickle. He'd uh, lost quite a lot of money in property, and um, he had debts. His marriage had fallen apart. He had two young daughters who had ended up with him. He was um, uh, taking a room off a friend. He was just sleeping on a mattress. He had a mattress in a wardrobe, two daughters, piles of clothes in one room uh, but he'd become a Christian and he fell in love with God and he knew his life was a little bit of a mess but he had realised uh, that he had a heart to help people and he, using his financial skills, he sort of started to sort himself out, he'd arranged plans with his people he owed money to his creditors and he'd started to figure out how to sort himself out from this mess and at this point in September 1996, he had made the decision that rather than go back into the financial world, he was going to step out in faith and start to make a career and a life out of helping others who got themselves into debt. <coughs> and so he went and saw his first client, this lady in Bradford, called Debbie. And at that time, he felt God sort of really showing him through the Word, through the Bible, a number of different scriptures just pointing out God's heart for the poor. So I thought we'd have a quick Bible study, a quick zip round a few of those. Uh, so if you've got Bibles ready, or if you'd like one, and there's just popping up to the stash, you stick your hand up, she'll come and give you one. We're going to start in Proverbs. Mm -hmm. Roughly in the middle of the Bible, those of you who are um, still working out the order of things. Some of them as Bibles have got little markers in the, in the, in the, up at the top to help you find Proverbs. Proverbs is 31. So Proverbs is a collection of wise sayings, a lot of them written by King Solomon back in the days of the Old Testament. And Proverbs 31, or I'll skip past myself, right at the end of Proverbs. Oh, it does have 31. Lovely. Right, the last, last bit of Proverbs. 31. Have we found it? There's still a few frowns around the room. Those of you who found it already and want to put their thumb in the next one, it's going to be Isaiah 25. Okay? Just for those who are still finding Proverbs 31. So Proverbs 31, verse 8 and 9 says... Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. So got that one? Mm -hmm. Isaiah 25 is next. Anybody's in the Blue Church Bibles and has grabbed? It's got to Isaiah. Say it again. 709. So it's not too far ahead of where we're going. 709. Isaiah 25, verse 4. Page 709 in the Blue Church Bibles. <coughs> you have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat, from the breath of the ruthless, is like a storm driving against a wall and like the heat of the desert. So you've been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in their distress. These scriptures, and one more we're going to read in a minute, which is from Luke 8, 
were scriptures that John, back in 1996, felt sort of jumped out of him as he was reading the word and as other people pointed out scriptures to him that were speaking to him of the God's heart for those who were in need and especially those who were struggling financially. In Luke chapter 4, now this is quoting Luke in New Testament and we are <coughs> in page 1013 Blue Bibles. Uh, in fact, 1031. This is quoting um, from the prophet Isaiah. So Jesus here is in the synagogue and he has asked someone to open one of the Old Testament scrolls, there have been scrolls in those days, to the prophet Isaiah. And this is, what he quotes here is like Jesus' kind of manifesto. This is my mission statement. So it's right at the beginning of Luke's Gospel, it's kind of at the beginning of his ministry, and he's explaining to those gathered around in the synagogue kind of what he's intended to do, what his heart is. So he quotes from Isaiah, and he says this in verse 18 and 19, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Now that's an interesting and amazing and a powerful statement of Jesus' ministry that he goes on to do. And as you read the New Testament and you, you, you see what Jesus is up to, he really is doing this stuff. But the last line is a curious one, isn't it? Proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Mm. Now that is harking back to something that God instituted in the Old Testament. He, before the people of Israel entered the promised land, after they'd left Egypt, they were travelling, <clears throat> God gave them a number of things. He spoke to them. He talked about, well, famously, the Ten Commandments. But he also gave them lots and lots of other rules and guidance for them as they entered this land. And one of those things that he came up with, one of God's ideas at the beginning, was this idea of jubilee. And explain briefly what Jubilee is. We use the word a lot, don't we? And we have Jubilee celebrations and the Queen's Jubilee when she was alive and all of those sorts of things. What did Jubilee mean when God instituted this idea back at the beginning, even before they'd entered the promised land? The idea was this. The land is God's land. He allowed people to go into that land, inhabit the land, and each person was given a portion of that land as their inheritance. Now, obviously, some people over the coming years would prosper and others would struggle. That is the way of life. But every seven years, sets of seven years, so every 50th year, everything would be returned to its original owners. All debts would be cancelled, all those who were enslaved would be freed, all of the people would move back to their original inheritance. But baked into this original idea of God's was that debts would get cancelled that would be a fresh start in the whole cycle of how God intended his people to live. There would be a periodic fresh start. Now, I don't think there's a huge amount of evidence, because it's not really mentioned that the, the people actually followed that and did the year of Jubilee. We don't know if they did or they didn't. But it was God's idea. It's his land. You were living on my land. And I wanted to go back to the original owners every 50th year. Interesting, isn't it? It's kind of like we in today's society, we have people of great wealth, we have people of great poverty, we have people who are really struggling. There's no sense of restitution and restoration and all of that, is there? Mm. I'm not trying to make any political statements. Really. <laughs> 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 but it's interesting to think about, isn't it? That, that, um, and here we are. So John Kirby sets up Christians <coughs> against poverty back in September 1996. In December 2016, Louise and I went off to visit our first cat client. Do you remember that, Louise? Yes. 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 Yeah. I've kind of hatched in my memory. My first client, a lady called Jodie. And off we went. We went to go and see her back in December of 2016. So we had decided here at uh, the King's Church, always had because of Richard and Louise and, and the history of the church, 
a heart for reaching out for our, our neighbours. And so we were running a job club at the time, as well as a number of other things. And a lot of folk were coming to our job club looking for help for finding work. And one of the things that came out from, from the work at the job club uh, and from our feast mill, which has been going for years, was that uh, many of the people coming into the King's Church were struggling financially. And Louise, in particular, I think, uh, that was my recollection of it anyway, <laughs> had, uh, had this kind of idea, well, could, could we perhaps do a bit more for those who are struggling financially? What could we do about it? I'd been a teacher, and I'd come out of teaching, and we'd moved here, we wanted to be a part of what Richard and Louise were doing. I had time because I didn't want to go back into teaching, but I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to go into at that point to have a look into this idea. We looked around and we settled on CAP. And so we set up our CAP centre and saw our first client together in September of, sorry, December of 2016. So you may be thinking, okay, I've heard the word CAP, I've seen the banner up, I can see a number up there, <coughs> I've heard about CAP. What exactly is it that we do? What do we do? I'm going to briefly explain the process, just in case you, you may not know. Um, what we do, so if somebody in our local area, in fact anybody nationally, if they call that 0800 number, there's a little jingle you can learn, a little sing song. Should we do it? Yeah. Should we sing it? Are you ready? You might need somebody on the piano. Get <laughs> up the tune. He goes, 0800 328 treble 06. Okay, you ready to sing along with me? You ready? Yeah. Okay. Oh eight hundred three two eight treble zero six. See now, if you meet anybody who's in financial need, sing them that song. <laughs> <laughs> sing them. We were on the cap training. We had to learn the song. Mm -hmm. It kind of stuck in my mind, even though it was like years ago. I thought we haven't sung it for a while. We sung it in the kitchen yesterday. It's a little practice, didn't we, as well? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, back to this. What do we do? So somebody calls that uh, that telephone number. That's the only way into our service. So they call that number, and a lovely person at the other end of the phone has a chat with them. And one of the things they ask, obviously, is a little bit about their situation, but also about where do they live. They look at the postcode, and if they have a centre, and we have about 300 centres around the country, of which I run one of them, if we have a centre in your area covering your postcode, then that person who's made that call will get an appointment with someone like me. And I'll go and see them. Now, I don't go see them on my own, I bring a volunteer from the local church. So, when we wanted to set up CAP, we realised we could not do this on our own. So, you need a big pool of people to call on to be able to take with you to go see clients. So, fortunately, and I just want to honour them right now, there are a number of other local churches who've come along with us right from the beginning and said, yes, we want to be part of this. We want to do what you're doing, and we want to have volunteers and go out and see our local people who've stuck their hand up and said, I want the church to come and help me in my financial situation. Because that's what people have done. They've called that number. Now, it's Christians Against Poverty. It's not a, oh, well, that's a surprise. I wasn't, wasn't expecting you to be Christians when you turn up. Yeah, it's in the name. They've asked the church to come and help. And so there's a number of churches who've been in there right from the beginning, a number of volunteers. I've probably had a total of maybe about 30 people in all who volunteered with me across about six or seven local churches, which is just want to honour them and say thank you to them here right now. And many of them are still volunteering with me. I've got 16 folk who are, who are on my volunteers list. Many of those have been there right from the beginning. And that is amazing. So we go and we visit. And we go and have a chat with that person and we, we kind of find out about their financial situation and we send all of their financial information up to some experts we've got in a call centre in Bradford. They will have a look at all of those financial, all of the finances and come up with a plan. And we go back and we explain the plan to, to the clients and give them all the various kind of explanations they need and give them all the, the paperwork they need to make that plan happen. And then a team at head office kind of look after them until they are completely debt free. Whatever that plan might be, it might be like year of jubilee, debts written off in some sort of insolvency process and a fresh start. Or it could be to pay off the debt over time. And we organise that for the client and help them to kind of make that process really straightforward. So there's various options it could be, but that's essentially what we're doing. And the great thing about it, going in with the local church, 
is that we go in as the church and we can offer perhaps a little bit more than just here's some help with your finances. So, we're going to have a little chat with Jenny and Emma <laughs> on the sofa. We're going to have a little imagine for it having a, a visit. So I've got my biscuits. Well, that's okay then. My biscuits. <laughs> Those of you who've been volunteers with me will know that this, I have, uh, have shares in Tesco's brilliant chocolate biscuits. The hard part about this is they live in a little stash under my desk and my family see this little stash all the time, don't they, Jesse? <laughs> and they want these biscuits and I say, no, those are not for you. And they've had to live with this for seven years. <laughs> we've got our cups of tea, they're actually glasses of water, but anyway, cups of tea, we've got our papers randomly stashed around, we've got our tissues ready. Anyway, should we have an interview? Should we do a little interview? Come on then. Right. Do I need to put it on mic? Yes. yes. Hello. Hello. Turn the bottom one. There. Oh, yes. Hello. 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 Okay. Good. Right. Should we have a cat visit? <laughs> oh, I've got my questions. I need those. Okay. Now, yeah. Okay, so we're, we're here uh, in Jenny's home, and we've come for a first visit. So, uh, just to explain, Jenny is—is is that okay to say? A real cat client, right? So, uh, so Jenny, first question for you: How did you feel about your life and finances and so on before? Emma and I knocked on your door. <laughs> so, just a really brief background. Um, I had a very long career, 14-year um, career, uh, in a job where I was travelling every three months overseas. Um, I had a mortgage. I had my daughter, who's <laughs> right there. And um, just trying to pull it all together, really. I was a single parent. and. Um, that was that was kind of the longest my longest career, but more and more on my conscience and my heart was the fact that my dad wasn't well. He had Alzheimer's and was living alone in Chertsey, and my conscience just said I need to be with him, and I couldn't concentrate on my work properly because I knew that I needed to be with him. So I gave up my job and moved in with him sold my house and um, helped my daughter and son-in-law get on the property ladder with the proceeds of the house, moved in with my dad and still needed to work, so worked from home, but this is going back a few years now and it was very unusual to work from home really, the jobs weren't that lucrative and I was very poorly paid and I was working sometimes about 80 hours a week, just um, on my computer, just to try and make a sort of living wage. Um, anyway, uh, father died and I bought a mobile home because I wanted to stay in Surrey to be near my daughter, my grandchildren, I couldn't afford bricks and mortar, so I bought a mobile home and carried on with this work I was doing, um, self-employed freelance transcriber, but it really did pay peanuts. And COVID came and I had no work for six months and it all just kind of piled up on me. Everything piled up and I started ignoring things and, you know, I had a, a pile of letters and papers that I just, I just thought, I can't, I can't do all this. You know, it was just too much for me. It was... And I had a visit from a bailiff once, and you know, that was really scary. And I just thought this is getting out of hand. Um, and so I knew about CAP because I um, am originally sort of Woking area, and there's a big church in Woking, and they've got a huge banner, uh, a CAP banner, Christians Against Poverty. <coughs> And I knew there were a few organisations I could go to, but I was really drawn to CAP. So that's what I did. And you, you and Emma arrived. 
with Simone K. Biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> I always sort of semi-joke with the clients that the reason I bring the biscuits is to entice them to make me a cup of tea. So it's a sort of bribe, really. You don't get that. You don't get that. I don't drink tea. We got our own at the same time, didn't we? Yes. You don't even get that. So how, Jay? How did you, honestly? How did you? I mean, on the day of our arrival, before we came, how were you feeling? Oh, really nervous. Um, I thought, I didn't think you'd judge me, but I thought you might have an opinion about how I'd got into this mess and why had I ignored it and why hadn't I sorted myself out. You know, I'm not unintelligent, I should be able to do this. this these are all the things I was telling myself. So I was wary, for sure. And then, so also, um, how would you describe your... Um, thoughts about God before Emma and I arrived. Okay, so um, I've always been a bit one foot in, one foot out. I've always had a faith, but I've never really belonged to a community. Um, many years ago, I used to work at, for a Caribbean airline, and um, I was telling Emma this mm -hmm. yesterday, and um, my boss became a born-again Christian. And I wasn't working there any long, but I wanted to go and see her. So I popped along on a Sunday, because we always have flights on a Sunday, and she was there in the office finishing up. And she asked how I was, and she said, I didn't even recognise you. I said, I know it's been a long time. She said, no, your spirit came in first. And I thought, wow, you know, I know, I know I'm damaged, but... <laughs> so um, that scared me a bit. Anyway, she said would you like to come to my church tonight? And it's Kensington Temple in Notting Hill in London. Wow. <laughs> um, which is a huge venue, um, and they have four services on a Sunday. That's how many people go. Um, and it's just, you know, it's like this on a grand scale, because they can, because they've got the capacity. And I went with her, and we started worship, and I just fell apart. Mm. I just sobbed. And um, the pastor asked for anybody who'd like to rededicate themselves to God, or anybody new who would like to start that journey. And I went down to the front. Mm. And I had the most profound experience that I've ever had. I was held physically held, and I've never had a hug like that in my life. Mm. I was just held, I was supported, and I knew it was God. Mm. I knew it was, and it's never happened since, and it probably, you know, may never happen again. But at that time, I had the arms of God around me, and I knew it. Mm. So, I felt new and I felt fresh, but again, I wasn't really walking with God. Yeah. So, as I say, one foot in, one foot out. That's mm -hmm. what I'd say. <laughs> Always had a strong faith, but not really committed to it, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Jenny. Mm -hmm. um, so, we've gone along and we've met Jenny, we've spent a bit of time with her. We've kind of talked about her finances, I had a bit of a laugh about this, that and the other, which was, be, which was great. And we're making our way through the program, through the process. And during that time, Emma, you you were kind of getting a bit more involved mm. with what Jenny was up to. Mm. So obviously, Daniel is really the one that is doing all the talking. And you sort of sit there and think, well, what can I do to help? And then we were finding bits of paperwork, and Jenny was saying, well, I don't really know where anything is. You can you can see these. You can see all these piles of stuff and I just don't know where stuff is. And I said, well, I don't know, I'm not doing anything. Do you want me to have to sift through it? And so, really, I just spent probably that hour and a half sifting through stuff for you and, and putting stuff in piles and finding old envelopes and writing on the front and tucking stuff in and just really sort of picking up the bits that you just couldn't face doing. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, you suddenly turned around and said, oh, oh, look. Yes. 
And it was a, and it, I just oh. felt that in that moment, it was practical. It was something practical. You didn't just need me to sit there. And obviously, you know, it, I didn't take it at the time. You know, I'm sitting there, every bit of paper. I'm praying, every question, every answer. I'm thinking, you know, Lord, this. I just want to see you come and work in this lady's life. Let her know how much you love her. Um, through this whole financial process that I see something of you in us, that we love her because you love her. And just doing the practical things was just a way that I could contribute to that process mm. at that moment. Mm -hmm. So, um, quite often with my clients, we have this, uh, go through this process, we get to the end of it, and um, the clients are, well, they don't always come to the end of it. Because when we do get to the end of it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they end up sitting here on a sofa in a church. <laughs> so, so, Jenny, so what sort of happened in terms of from when we first met you mm. to you now being here mm. with Sky mm. every Sunday? Mm. So when we were, when we were um, on that first mm. meeting, I remember either Daniel or, or Emma asking what I believed in or did I believe in anything. And I said I've always had a strong faith. And Emma said, do you have a church? Do you go to a church? Well, no, 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 that's a step too far. <laughs> <laughs> Just leave me here with my faith, thank you. <laughs> um, so, um, I don't know, Emma and I... We connected, for sure, mm. on that first visit. Not just in a practical sense, because Emma was just a, an absolute whiz at sorting out my paperwork. I don't know how she did it in an hour and a half, when I haven't done it in ten years. Um, but we connected, and I, I don't know how or why. Um, well, I know why. Um, but God connected us, for sure. Um, and I just thought, you know, this this lady, I'm drawn to this lady, and and Emma was Emma carried on contacting me, um, and my first time here was actually the Christmas Carol concert, mm. which I loved, and I thought, oh, that I'll do that every year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be enough. <laughs> Those carols. <laughs> Um, you know, I'll show my face and, uh, yeah, I like that. I like that singing. I'll go along to that. Um, but that's not how it went. And God's obviously working in a different way. And I felt drawn here, drawn to here. I feel this is my safe place. And I felt like i have come home. And... I suppose I'm four months in, I think, three or four months in, still very new, but Sky had started, my daughter had started to become interested as well in something that she needed, and she went to a, a, an Anglican church in her village. She said, Mum, it's so dry, you know, it's just... I said, well, come with me. <laughs> I'll show you what's not dry. <laughs> so here we are. Yeah. You know, and it's just like, I can't really believe that. I, I, I knew I was looking, but I didn't know what I was looking for. So this, is, this, this was what it was. Uh, and... I know you're not quite through the woods in terms of your finances yet, but how do you feel about your finances now that we've kind of journeyed with you for the last few months? Mm. Mm. It's, it's a huge relief to know that things are working out and that slowly, slowly I'm chipping away. It's going to take a while. Yeah. That's okay. Um, it's not easy. Yeah. It's not easy at all because you're on... Quite, well, a strict budget. So if anything comes along out of the blue that you didn't plan for, it's quite difficult to negotiate. Um, but I know it's the right thing to do. And, you know, it's just stopped all those phone calls that I never used to answer. 
They used to frighten the life out of me. Mm. It's just gone quiet and peaceful. And I'm six months in with Cap, and I know that, you know, they send me little encouragements and they send me a statement every month, and I can just see it gradually decreasing. Um, and I just know that I'm doing the right thing for sure, and I will get there. Don't know how long it'll take, but I will get there. <laughs> Jenny, thank you. Emma, was there anything else you wanted to add? I don't think it's okay. Can we just um, pray for Jenny? I yeah. think it's the right thing to do right at this very moment. Um, let's do that. Mm -hmm. Holy Father, thank you for Jenny's courage in calling that 0800 number those six odd months ago, for going through this process, for her journey so far. We pray, Lord, that you would help her see it through. <coughs> to that glorious day that is a little closer now when she will no longer have any financial debts anymore and she'll be debt free. And I just want to thank you, Lord, for bringing her into our, our family here at the King's Church. And we pray, Lord, that you bless her and that she would always be at home here. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you thank so you. much. <laughs> Emotionally, how that was going to go. <laughs> oh, that is amazing. Thank you. Now, Jenny is not my only client. There have been 176 people that we at the King's Church, that I, along with all my volunteers, that we have gone out to go and see. 176 people. And they too need your prayers. So we're going to do a little prayer exercise now. I have no idea how this is going to go, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be chaotic, which is fine, okay? So I have written on this block here the names of all of the people that I've seen through CAP. Wow. Um, so just starting with the very first one, Jodie, and then just flicking through. Now the names are just, if it's common first names, I've just kept it as first names. If it's uh, slightly unusual first names. I might have kind of um, gone like a Mrs. T or Mr. B or whatever, because the idea is that you're never going to know who these people are. Obviously, you know, Jenny is one of them. But other than that, it's supposed to be anonymous, okay? But each of these people are real people. Some are no longer with us, some have passed away, some are uh, debt free. About 40 of these 176 people are completely debt free now. Uh, there's about 15 of them who are still in the process of journeying along with CAP to get to that point of being debt free. The others may come back at some point. Each of them have a family, each of them have people who, who love them, and the idea is we're going to pray for them. Now that's a lot of people, 176 people. So what we're going to do, it's going to be a bit bad, is you're going to come, you're going to grab one of these, okay? You're going to take it along with The clothes peg, which are going to be on the table. Right? You're going to grab one with a clothes peg and you're going to take it, and while you're taking it, or when you get to one of the green pieces of string that are hung hang either there or there, and Chris has expertly measured it the other day to make sure it's long enough, <laughs> pacing up a doubt. Um, you're going to take one. You're going to pin it on that string, and as you do so, you're going to pray for that person. Okay? And then you're going to come back and get another one. Okay? There's, I'm guessing, maybe 30 ish people here. There's 170 odd names on here, so you're going to need to do that about five or six times. Okay? 30 times six is 180. Yeah? Which covers everybody. Okay? So it's going to, it may take a little while, so don't take long and detailed prayers. You know, prophetic speaking into each person, because then we'll never get through everybody's. But as Richard showed at the beginning, Richard, what was the prayer that you suggested? Well, you could have Lord have mercy on. Yes, or, Lord have mercy on this person, Lord bless this person, bless Lord this. encourage this person, whatever's on your heart to pray for them. But they, all of these people, they need God. And 
one day they may come and join us here, who knows, or in one of our other local churches. So is that okay? Does that sound like a bit of a plan? I'm going to slightly move.